to remind you, this is a very, very important week. Starting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, in the cold and in the rain. Hey, you know it rains every week. So it's gonna, we're going to have prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting, beginning tonight, I mean beginning tomorrow night, Monday through Friday, right here in the sanctuary. Yes, it's going to be cold, but we're going to have the heat on, all right? Uh, we be here fast this week, fast this week, fast this week, and be here at 6 o'clock, except on Wednesday. 6 o'clock, we will be having prayer and communion every night. Prayer and communion every night. Sister Amy will be speaking tonight at 6 o'clock. Sister Amy will be teaching. Make sure you all come back with open ears for uh, your, your first lady. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody just go hallelujah again. I believe God is worthy of some praise in this house. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. If you even need to turn there, I'm not sure. I'll start reading at verse number 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Verse 8 says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts chapter 2 says, But when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Father, send me your revival in power. We ask you now to bless this word, bless us with a manifestation of your glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, and the house says, so be it. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been preaching on the theme of 2019. And what I believe God desires to do in our church, in our community, in our region. I believe that we're living in the last days. Who remember the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29? God says he'll pour his spirit out on all people. And that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men shall uh, see visions. Old men will have dreams. And the spirits will be poured out on young, uh, on men, on women, even on the servants. And God's going to show wonders in heaven on earth. Going to show wonders in the earth, the blood, the fire, and the billows of smoke. I believe God desires to send revival. It's a promise of his word. Over the last two weeks, I've given you four of the eight signs of true revival. And let me also say the first four signs of true revival are also prerequisites for revival. In other words, you cannot have revival unless the first four are fulfilled by the people of God. First of all, a sign of revival is it must be a true work of God. We don't want anything that can be conjured up by a man. We don't want anything our emotions can bring alert and, and cause us to act. We want God's divine hand to reach out of heaven and touch this congregation and in essence touch this community and this region. The second sign of true revival and the prerequisite, it must be a place of repentance. Anytime true revival happens, it becomes a house of repentance. And in order for revival to come, the church first must repent. And not only must we repent, we must return to God. Many people will say they're sorry, but never return from their pig pen and run back to God. So not only do we repent, we return to God. And then last week I mentioned it must produce holiness. Real revival always produces holiness, which we also called sanctification. Today, I want to preach on an important aspect of real revival. A real revival, the fifth point of this series, people are filled and empowered by the Spirit. If you don't mind me saying, people are filled and empowered by the Holy Ghost. In the beginning history of the church of God, 
Ten years after eight people formed the Christian Union with a commitment of following the New Testament as their rule for faith and practice, a revival broke out at the Sheriff Schoolhouse in Camp Creek, North Carolina, and they began to preach a doctrine of holiness and a doctrine of sanctification, and all of a sudden, out of their preaching of sanctification, the Holy Ghost fell among those people, and the early church and God believers began to speak in tongues, and they began to witness divine healings. The group of people went from a, a desiring more of God to being a group that received more of God. And the church of God is still flowing in this Pentecostal power some 130 years later because a real revival always produces real power. <laughs> Lord, I ain't got time to stop and meddle. But a real revival always produces real power. That's why you see some places break out in what they call a momentary revival. They'll break out into a, a couple of week revival. I've seen churches go three, four weeks, five, six weeks, eight weeks of revival. And then eight weeks after it's over, it goes right on back to being the dead church it was before the eight week of revival. But a real revival produces a fire that doesn't stop at the end of revival, but that continues to burn for generations to come. See what I'm asking is for God to send a revival of Holy Ghost power that will affect not only my kids, but my grandkids. My Lord, I have a feeling that one of the problems, however, that has developed over the years in the Pentecostal movement is a continuation of tongues but a diminishing of power. We have edified and dressed up the gifts to make them fit inside our services and we make them a reform so that people will feel a little more comfortable around the gifts. But in the process, we have denied the power that we are promised. Luke chapter 3 verse 16, John said, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But the one more powerful that I will come with whose tongues of sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. What I believe the church needs is not necessarily more tongue talking. But I believe we don't need more people baptized in the fire of God's power. We need an outpouring of the Holy Ghost of God which comes only after we repent and only after we are sanctified. That's why that week I preached on the revival bring, bringing holiness and sanctification. And the reason for that sanctification is it is the roadway that leads us to the baptism of Holy Ghost power. It is the road to holiness and the role of sanctification that leads us into the fire baptism. And I believe God wants his church full of power. Not to impress each other in church services, but to become more effective in our ministry to the world. Oh, it's, not, it's time that we quit trying to impress each other with how la 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 we can speak and how eloquent we can babble in the tongue. No, 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 we need a baptism of Holy Ghost yeah. power yeah. so that we become effective in ministry. Yes. He wants to empower us to save souls. He wants to empower us to heal the sick. Yeah. He wants to empower us to deliver the oppressed. He wants to empower us to set the captive spirit free. <coughs> God needs a church to be full of power in order to be effective in reaching its community. The gift of the Holy Ghost is not to move us up some spiritual ladder, if there was such a thing, but to bring us into full submission to be helpers and servants in the field of the harvest. In other words, God wants to empower the church so that we can win the loss to Jesus Christ, so that drug addicts are set free and that wilds come to sober, so that the lost of the community come flooding into the altar. Our text declares that we should reach and receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. That we should be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Oh, we love to talk about the signs and the sounds of Pentecost as I laid out in Acts chapter 2. We love the sound of the mighty rushing wind that filled the upper room. We, we love seeing the cloven tongues split apart and sitting upon the heads of each one of them. We love to hear the sound of those early believers speaking in other tongues. We love this part of Pentecost because it gives us the emotional boost we need. It is exciting, it's emotional, it's encouraging, it's mystifying. But the real result of Pentecost, the real result of this upper room experience, it took 120 men and women who were nervous, intimidated, and afraid. It took them out of the upper room and onto the streets of Jerusalem. 
Acts chapter 2 and through the rest of the chapter, beginning at verse number 5, begins to explain the real purpose of Pentecost. They moved from the upper room speaking in a new tongue, and they displayed the power. And this, people began to take notice of these drunk men, you suppose. But we're not drunk as you think. It's only the, the third hour of the day. It's only 9, nine o'clock in the morning. Surely we're not drunk yet. <laughs> and I allowed the power, the display of this anointing, the display of this power. I allowed pre Peter to preach the very first New Testament crusade. I'm talking about the same Peter that was rebuked for telling Christ what he thought. The same Peter that cut off a man's ear and got rebuked again by Jesus. The same Peter that denied Jesus three times and cursed if he was one of the commoners. The Peter that fled and returned to his fishing career. The Peter that was uneducated in the system of the day. It was the same Peter who later was confronted by Paul for being a hypocrite. But despite all of his shortcomings, God still filled Peter with the power of the Holy Ghost and he preached a message in the boldness and the full power of the Holy Ghost. And in verse 37, people said, oh, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 38, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God used a man who was so messed up that many of us would have already forgot about it.
This empowerment is not just to help me share my faith. Listen, because I know we see in, in this Acts chapter 2, they stepped out, no longer cowards, but bold and courageous, speaking in unknown tongues and preaching the gospel. So many times people will say, oh, this is so that I can share in power. No, 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 but it also helps you de demonstrate your faith. It helps you share your faith, but it helps you to demonstrate your faith. Everybody say demonstrate. Oh, yeah. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. These signs shall follow them who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You see, the scripture displays a manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost. What we have moved into in this last day, church, is that we speak in tongues but never have a manifestation of the power that comes along with the tongues. You see, we ought to be able to preach and witness in power, but we should also be able to pray in power. A church full of the Holy Ghost should not only operate with powerful words, but also have a manifestation of his power through signs and wonders. Oh, some of you done backed up. <laughs> some of you done got quiet. You hesitate when I start talking about laying hands on folk in power. Oh, you don't mind me telling you to speak in tongues, praying in a seed in tongues, praying in a seed in tongues. Oh, oh, and, and you don't mind being real soft and whispering it. But now you want your, you mean the pastor's asking me to do something other with this power than just pray? Absolutely. I'm trying to follow the New Testament rule of what the church did. They were going to lay hands on the sick and the power of God back. somewhere after church, but let me just take a moment and say something. You see, what we have done in Pentecostal churches nowadays, we have learned to get folk baptized in the Holy Ghost. We learn to hear them see. But see, what happens in the Bible is God begins to confirm through the power. If you're going to speak in tongues, he'll confirm the tongues is real by casting out a devil. Ooh, I almost feel a main street. Sister, man, I got to watch out. As Dr. Tim Hill says, I don't know if it's a main street or the anointing. One way or the other. What I'm asking God for in this year of revival, what I believe God wants to do in this year of revival, is not only have a lot of folk talking in tongues, but confirming that what we got is real. Because he has what, here's what's happened. Here's what's tainted the church. Here's what's hurt the church. You got a lot of tongue talkers living like devils. But why do we want to get there if we don't live just like everybody else? But a real church in revival. God backs up the power inside of them. God confirms his word inside of you. Well, I'm about to have a spell. I'm about to have a big spell. If I fall out under the power, somebody just pick up in my notes and read. Don't come up here doing your own thing. You read what I done wrote. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. Listen. It is a proof that Jesus is operating in us. It's proof that we've got what we say we've got. It's proof that the Holy Ghost is in you. In this list that I found by the Inglewood Christian Assembly of God, let me show you how God confirms his words through miracles. Acts chapter 2 verse 43 and Acts chapter 5 verse 12 says, Many signs and wonders, miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Peter and John healed the lame man in Acts chapter 3. Peter's shadow fell on the sick, healing them in Acts chapter 5. Stephen performed miracles and signs and wonders in Acts chapter 6. 
Philip cast out demons and healed the lame in Acts chapter 8. Peter heals the lame and Lydia in Acts chapter 9. Peter raised Tabitha from the dead in Acts chapter 9. Paul and Barnabas performed signs and wonders in Iconium in Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas healed the crippled man who had faith in Acts 14. Paul and Silas cast a demon out of a fortune-telling slave girl in Acts chapter 16. Paul was given extreme power for many unusual miracles in Acts chapter 19. Paul raised Eutychus from the dead after a terrible accident in Acts chapter 20. Paul un, uh, was unharmed by a poisonous snake bite in Malta in Acts 28. Paul healed Publius, his father, of a fever and infection of his intestines in Acts 28. Paul healed all the sick people on the island of Malta in Acts 28. We know Jesus in the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus flowed in healing him. The apostles flowed in healing him. I believe we ought to flow in healing too. The same God that healed him is the same God that healed him. We ought to be flowing in signs and wonders. And it requires a real dose of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Jesus' main reason for performing his own miracles were to glorify the Father. The same God, he was announcing the kingdom of God had arrived in the flesh. Hey, Jesus says, hey, I am the son of God. Watch what I can do. Both Jesus' teachings and his miracles were witnesses to who he truly was. The son of God, the savior of the world. In essence, Christ's miracles happened to be an expression of salvation. And may I ask this church a question? Is there any reason we ought to think less? Is there any reason to think that Jesus' apostle had any other definite reasons of doing miracles than what Jesus did? No, the same reason Jesus did it was to point everybody to God. The same reason the apostles flowed in the gift of healing was to point everybody to God. Jesus' apostles' main reasons for, for, for performing miracles were so God could get glory and they could talk about Jesus, the Messiah. Listen, miracles are attention getters and great works of authorization of the gospel message of which the apostles were the prime conveyors. But the apostles and the gospel needed to be authentic. Lord, help me, I can't even say that word. They need to be proven to be real, which this amazing signs and wonders provided real authenticity. It proved that they were real. John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I tell you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, you shall do also. And you shall do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Today, these ways are all the reasons God showed us his greatness. First, through the prophets of old, like Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. Then Jesus showed the signs through himself. And then finally, Jesus' apostles displayed the same power. These miracles are for your benefit, so that you can dream draw people to the Son of Jesus Christ, and I believe God wants to let this year of revival be filled with signs and wonders, because we will be people who want God's anointing to break backs of bondage. He still wants to prove who He is. God wants a, a, a world that's becoming more atheistic as the days go by. A church, a world where people begin to believe in false gods and, 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 and false religions more than they believe in the one true God. I believe he is raising up a remnant in this last day that he can prove there is but one God, Jehovah. There is no one like God. I believe he wants to send an old-fashioned revival, gift us with the signs and wonders of Pentecost so that he once again can confirm his word with power. Yeah. Acts chapter 14, verse 3. Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord. Listen to what he did. And he confirmed the message of grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. He confirmed who he was by what he did through them. Can I tell you, Sister Sandra, you better come. Can I tell you, God still wants to confirm his word in the power and the acts of power. The church needs an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival when the fire of God is poured out again. We need more than be able to hear the echoes of tongues around our building. I want to hear tongues and then witness power. I want to hear tongues and then see confirmation that you really got what you think you got. That the God of the blessing, why is it I can flow with that kind of gift? Why is it, Pastor Chris, that I can lay hands on the sick? Because it's the third part of heaven. It's part of Jesus living inside of me. It's the third part of God living inside of me. And because he's inside of me, he reaches through me. And I lay hands on somebody, and they are it ain't even me. It's because that much power is inside of me. It 
Uh, oh, Pastor Chris, you're getting deeper than I want to get. Listen, I think it's time we stop settling down for a watered-down version of revival. It's time we quit settling for what, what somebody thinks cool makes me feel good. I'm talking about a revival that brings us to our face on repentance. A revival that causes us to leave the world and return back to God. A revival that will sanctify us and, and cause us to live holy. A revival that will bring fire out of heaven and confirm his word to a people that are dying and lost and going to hell. He wants to prove himself. You better stand on your feet or I may not stop preaching. Can we sing something about power? Sister Sandra, you picked me a good fast song about power. Listen, I think it's time the church receive what God wants to give us. I, I believe it's time we receive a, not just the gift to, to talk, but I'm asking God to get confirmed himself. That God will convict us of being tongue talkers but no power. People that, that flow without confirmation. I would ask that God begins to confirm in me and Damien and Tiffany and Amy and Mandy and Rock, anybody who speaks in tongues, which I wish was everybody in this room. We are a Pentecostal tongue-talking church. We ought to have more of you baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Why, Pastor Chris? Because it is the promise of confirmation of His Word. You don't need an evangelist to get you fired up. It's the Word of God. Let it come in. Well, I think it died out. Why would the fire of God die out? Can somebody justify why it dies out? Can somebody tell me why God would say, Well, the last apostle has now died, and it's not for you anymore. That's a, that don't even make sense. Can anybody justify why we don't need the Holy Ghost today just like the early church believed it? I don't think you can. What I'm asking for is for a church that can come. That you teenagers, that y'all get so in love with God, you begin to repent, get sanctified, return to God. You get full of the Holy Ghost, and you begin to lay hands on people, and they get saved and healed in the love. My Lord, come to this altar. Come to this altar. I had a different direction. I just want everybody who knows to come to the altar. Everybody who can, get in this altar. Come close, come close. Don't be in the eyes. My Lord, my Lord. There's still power. There's still power. This is going to be a year of revival, Rising Fun. It's going to start by the work of God. This year of revival is going to start with a group of people who repent. This year of revival is going to start with a group of people that will return to God. As you get in this altar, I want you to begin to pray. As you get in this heart to begin to pray and ask God to confirm his power through you. Let us not just be satisfied with tongue talking. Ask God to convict you. Begin to confirm his power. That, that, that we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That we can anoint with oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Oh God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let us not be a church that preaches with the gospel and not experience it. Let us not be a church that preaches Pentecost, but not have confirmation of Pentecost. And God, I'm not just talking about jumping and leaping. I'm not just talking about dancing and running. I'm talking about God. Power being flowing like fire from heaven. God, confirm your word even this morning. Confirm your word this morning. Confirm, James, come here, you first Jesus Christ is 
Come right. 